Hello and welcome back. So today I want to look at electronic circuit shielding and in particular look at how a good magnetic shield needs to be designed. That of course means looking at the principles behind how a shield can shield magnetic fields. So what makes it better or worse at this by looking at what are the important properties of the materials involved. So for this I will be testing and measuring the two main methods of magnetic field shielding. So on the one side you have magnetic flux deviation using magnetically permeable materials and on the other side you have magnetic field repulsion by relying on eddy currents induced into conductive materials. So if you're curious about how this all works and well if it works then keep watching. So first of all, why should we care about magnetic fields? And why should these be treated separately from an electromagnetic wave? Well, the main issue involves distance and wavelength. So when you're close to a noise source, so you're in the near field, the impedance of the electric field and the magnetic field are different. So these two can have different effects on the circuit in the sense that one of them can be more damaging than the other. So it makes sense to create a shield specifically for the type of noise that you want to shield against. So for example, with a power transformer working at 50 or 60 Hertz, circuitry that is close to it will be mostly affected by the magnetic fields emitted by the transformer. You will have almost negligible amounts of electric fields being emitted. In a similar way, in modern day switch mode power supplies, the main type of noise coming from the power inductor or power transformer will still be magnetic fields. So to keep sensitive circuitry around these power sources safe, you will need to design a shield specifically to shield against the magnetic fields being emitted by the noise sources. So what can be done about these noise sources? How can we shield against magnetic fields? Well, before looking into that, let's first look at a test setup that can assess the effectiveness of the magnetic shielding material. So the test setup that I will be working with today involves the usage of two inductors placed on this plastic frame. And now one of the inductors is connected to the power amplifier, which is connected to the signal generator. So this will be working like our noise source. So the noisy circuit or transformer or whatever. And the second inductor is connected to the oscilloscope's first channel and to a termination resistor. So the second inductor represents our sensitive circuit which we need to protect from our noise source. So by default, when the signal generator is activated, we can see that there's a voltage being induced into the second coil, which is displayed on the oscilloscope. So what I will be trying to do is add various materials in between the two coils to work as a shield to prevent voltage being induced into the second inductor. So the first shielding method to look at is the use of magnetically permeable materials. So what I drew here is first of all a noise source with magnetic field lines closing around it through free space. So normally you will get these arcs going from one side of the noise source back down to the other. So these field lines will always have to close through some place. Now, as with anything in life, magnetic field lines tend to go through the path of least resistance. Or in this particular case, the path of highest permeability. So one way of expressing how easily magnetic field lines pass through a medium is by its magnetic permeability. Air and vacuum and so on have a permeability of one, but other materials like ferrite or iron or new metal or whatever have higher permeabilities. So magnetic field lines will tend to go through these materials rather than through the air around. So the way this sort of shielding works is that it provides a path for the field lines other than the air around it through which these can close back to the source. So in an ideal case, if the material is thick enough and permeable enough, all the field lines that touch it go through it and then close back. So no field lines will go over this material. So by adding a shield made from this kind of permeable material, the space behind it will be protected from the magnetic fields. So it's important to notice that the field lines are going parallel with the material in this case. 
So to test this principle out, I have some ferrite sheet. So this is a material that is commercially available. It, it's not very cheap, but it's available. And this does not have any sort of electrical conductivity. So it only has magnetic permeability and it has about a value of 100. So right now, if I insert this into my inductors, so we can see that at the moment we have 872 millivolts of signal being induced. If I insert this into the two coils, we can see that our induced voltage decreases to about 408. So we basically halved the signal level that gets into the second inductor. Now, other than the permeability of the material, what we are interested in is how thick the material is. So at the moment, I used four pieces of 0.05 millimeter thickness ferrite sheet. But if, for example, I remove two of the sheets, so I'm left with only half, and we retry our experiment, we have our initial 856, and we now only drop down to 520. So the thicker the material was, the better the shielding effect. Now, the other main method of shielding involves the use of electrically conductive materials. So things like steel or copper. And the way these work as a magnetic shield is that the field coming from our noise source hits the material. And if this is a variable magnetic field, so this will not work at DC, it will only work with oscillating magnetic fields. These fields will induce a current into the conductive material. So this is what's called an eddy current. And now this current passing through the conductive material will generate its own magnetic field. So this one in blue. And the important thing to observe here is that the two magnetic fields are going in opposite directions. So on the other side of this conductive plate, we have two magnetic fields going in opposing directions. So in an ideal world, the two will completely cancel each other out. Now, in reality, the amount of shielding provided by your conductive plate will be determined by just how strong the opposing fields you can create and how close these fields will be to the initial strength of the noise source. So now there's two properties that we need to be interested in. So first of all, we care about the conductivity of this material. The more conductive it is, the higher currents that can pass through it. And on the other side, we are interested in its permeability because the more permeable the material is, the stronger magnetic fields that our induced current can generate. So to test this principle out, I have two sheets of conductive material. One is a bit of steel, so this was from an old soda can, and the other is the PCB, which I soldered onto so it doesn't oxidize. So this is roughly 35 micrometers of copper, and this is about 150 micrometers of steel. So now if I insert this into the coil, so let's start with the steel, we can see that we have substantial decrease down to about 400 millivolts. And if we insert the copper, we have a decrease. So we went from 800 something to 700 something, but it's quite a small decrease. So the sheet of copper is not that useful at this particular frequency. So right now I'm testing at one kilohertz. But one of the important things to observe is how these two materials behave if we change the test frequency. So with the exact same setup, I just changed my test frequency to 10 kilohertz, and now we have a default value when no material is inserted of 888 millivolts being induced into the second inductor. And now if we insert the two shielding materials, so first of all the iron, we see that we go down to 264 millivolts. And if we try out the copper plate, we go down to 648. So in both cases, we're getting better shielding at 10 kilohertz than we did at 1 kilohertz. And the main reason for obtaining a difference here is that the induced currents, the value of the induced currents is frequency dependent. The higher the frequency, the stronger currents you can induce. And therefore, a better shielding effect you can get for the same thickness of material. Now, to assess just how much shielding you need, the effectiveness of a material 
can be calculated based on its skin depth. So this is a parameter that takes into account both electrical conductivity and magnetic permeability to calculate how deep currents run through a material. And now from a shielding point of view, where currents are induced from external magnetic fields, every skin depth of a material will have an attenuation of 8.7 decibels. So the thicker the material is, the more skin depth you have, the better shielding you will be getting. And now of course skin depth is frequency dependent, so we can see that with increasing frequency we get better shielding. Now skin depth of various materials is usually characterized in graphs, so you can find this sort of graphs in various places, but this particular graph is special, so I'll be leaving a link to this in the description of course, because it shows one of the frequency dependent properties that's not always shown in these characterizations. And that is that magnetic permeability is not a constant. So what we can observe here is that the material that will achieve the greatest amount of shielding for the thinnest amount of material is steel. Because even though it doesn't have great electrical conductivity, it has a lot of permeability. So it's better than copper, for example. But at high frequencies, things change a bit. And the main reason for this is that although steel has permeability, it will go away at high frequencies. So the permeability is not a constant. It's frequency dependent and it drops with increasing frequency. So at very high frequencies, if you no longer have permeability, then the best material will be the most conductive material. And to show off this effect, I prepare the same setup as before, so I have my two coils, and rather than connect them to the signal generator and oscilloscope, I connected them to the spectrum analyzer with the tracking generator output. Point being that I want to look at the behavior of the shielding materials over a wider frequency range. So I set the device to sweep from 9 kHz up to 1 MHz. And now first step was to normalize the response, so we have a flat response. Now by inserting the various materials, we can see how they affect the signal coming into the second inductor. So first things first, let's start with the ferrite sheet. So all four pieces of these. So if I insert this into the coil, well, we can see that we went from minus six decibels down to about minus 12. And we see that the response is almost perfectly flat. And this is exactly what we would expect. The permeability of the ferrite sheet is fairly constant. So the attenuation is constant. Only at very high frequencies will this permeability start to drop and then the attenuation should also drop. But other than that, it should be fairly flat. Now, if we go to another material, go to our copper PCB, we now see our clear frequency dependent behavior. So as frequency increases, so does attenuation. We start from about minus six decibels of attenuation. So minus six to minus 12 is minus six and we end up at minus 36, so a total of 30 decibels at 1 megahertz. And we see that our attenuation increases at a very constant rate. So there's no bumps in the attenuation curve, it's a flat line. Now, if we turn to our last material, our sheet of steel, we see that we have much higher attenuation than with our copper sheet. That's because the steel is much thicker, but it also, it's far more permeable. But another thing that we notice is that shielding effectiveness doesn't constantly increase, it has these bumps. So shielding effectiveness does increase with frequency, but not at a constant rate. And the main thing that we are seeing here is that the permeability of steel is not a constant. It decreases with increasing frequency, and by the time you reach one megahertz, its permeability is almost completely gone. So I looked at this in an older video and there's also proper research done on the topic where you can see that the permeability of iron decreases with increasing frequency. So it's definitely not a constant. And this permeability is highly dependent on the grade of material that you have. So different materials, different compositions will have different permeability. And this permeability will behave differently with frequency. So in the end, depending on what you're trying to do, both the material and its thickness will have a massive impact on your shielding performance. For example, if you're working in the audio range, then you will need high permeability materials. So at least steel, or if the budget permits more exotic materials, 
Whereas if you're working in the tens or hundreds of megahertz range, even a few tens of micrometers of copper might be enough, or better yet, you might just get away with using conductive paint. So you might not even need a proper shielding enclosure. But it all depends on your particular use case. There's no universal optimum solution. And with that said, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my latest videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.